As the Sunday lectionary continues to lead us through the story of David, this past Sunday we came to David's elegy over Saul and Jonathan, called the Song of the Bow, or more simply, just the bow. The armies of Israel had gone out to war with the Amalekites, and at the end of the first book of Samuel, we read of the death of both Saul and his son Jonathan in battle. Sunday's reading from the first chapter of 2 Samuel recounts how David, after his own victory, received this news of the death of his king and of his great friend from an enemy messenger. We know that David was a gifted and skilled musician, and tradition holds him to be the author of many of the Psalms, which are in fact, of course, songs. So it should be no surprise that David channeled his grief for those two fallen heroes into a song of lament. He ordered that this song should be taught to the people, and the text says that it was written in the book of Jashar, one of the great lost texts of antiquity. But we have the song here in Second Samuel chapter 1. David wrote, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen! For the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson, in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother, Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. David wrote a Hebrew verse form called Kinah, a dirge or lament meter, with the first half longer than the second. So we can see that he used a form familiar to his people, and he gives his song to them as a gift for their own grief and for their own memory. And he used this form as a channel for his own grief as well. This will not be the last time, of course, in David's life that we see him express his grief, but it is, as far as we know, the first The relationship between works of art and grief is ancient and abiding. The elegy is an enduring form. In his great poetic work, In Memoriam, Tennyson writes to explore and live out his grief at the death of his great friend, Arthur Henry Hallam, who died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 23. Hallam had been considered by all who knew him to be one of the most promising figures of his age. He was the leader of the Apostles, a literary group at Cambridge, and he was Tennyson's fellow artist, mentor, and great friend. In fact, he was engaged to marry Tennyson's sister, Emily. Tennyson began composing the poems in this great work soon after Hallam's death and continued to write for some 15 years. His poems struggle not only with love and loss, but with the question of the immortality of the soul. And he gives expression to the doubts rising both within himself and in his culture around religious faith in Victorian England, following the publication of Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology. Early on in this poetic cycle, Tennyson writes, I sometimes hold it half a sin to put in words the grief I feel, for words, like nature, half reveal and half conceal the soul within. He gives voice to both the anxiety and the guilt that lie around poetic construction that rises out of the death of another, and also he expresses the usefulness of this form. Many years earlier, the poet Ben Jonson wrote similarly in expressing his grief at the death of his first son at the age of seven. In what Tennyson called measured language, Johnson wrote, Rest in soft peace, and asked, Say, Here doth lie Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. But for the unquiet heart and brain, Tennyson wrote, A use in measured language lies, The sad mechanic exercise, Like dull narcotics, numbing pain, 
has been the device of generations of poets. William Wordsworth, in writing Surprised by Joy. Milton, earlier even than Tennyson, writing following the death of his son about Lycidas, dealing with his own anxiety at the early death of one so promising. John Donne, a contemporary of Ben Jonson, wrote repeatedly about death, a subject close to him in his own life, and later on a part of his work as an Anglican priest. In his work, Death Be Not Proud, his concluding couplet says this, One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Don's words pick up an echo from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. The last enemy to be destroyed, Paul wrote, is death. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And then Paul quotes, in that last, from Isaiah, and next, from Hosea. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, Paul writes. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Pulpit to Pew, a podcast that features a conversation between priest and parishioner to understand how the message translates and to further explore the weekly lessons within the Episcopal tradition and daily life. The Very Reverend Beverly Gibson, Dean of Christ Church Cathedral, and Johnny Gwen, a newcomer to the Episcopal family, discuss what Beverly intended and Johnny heard, or got wrong. So the reading this week, the thing that stood out to me was David's grief for loss of his friend Jonathan. Right. And King Saul, too, but as I remember, Saul and him kind of had a tricky relationship. <laughs> yeah, it was somewhat problematic in that Saul was trying to kill him. But other than that, they really didn't have any struggles. Saul, of course, had fallen from God's favor, and David had received it. How much of this did David know? Well, that's impossible to say, probably mm-hmm. relatively little. And yet Saul was the king, and Saul had, despite some of his other problems, had been very generous to David, had taken them taken him into his own household, had given him opportunity, had raised him up above others, and he was, of course, the king. And so at the news of this great loss, David felt, as most of us would feel, um, grieved profoundly. It was after a a battle, correct? Yes, it was after a battle. And David was obviously not with them in battle, and they had both been taken down, and the news of him came, the, the news of their death came to him through one of the enemy warriors, one of the Amalekite men, came and and said to David that they had both died. And David receives this news and then ultimately uh, kills this fellow uh, because he's desecrated the corpse of Saul uh, and then possibly even Jonathan. And that, of course, another ancient tradition calls to my mind uh, one of the great scenes out of the Iliad when Achilles finally comes back to battle and kills Hector and then wants to drag his corpse around and around and around (laughs) the the funeral pyre of Patroclus. And the gods look down and they're just appalled. Um, That's kind of hard to do. Yeah, yeah, that's just pretty hard to do that. So even Apollo, uh, who does some pretty nasty things himself, casts a kind of shroud around the body of Hector so that it's preserved in some dignity to be taken back to his father. And I just kind of went off course. But all of these stories partake of a common language of, of heroism and battle and then, of course, the logical loss uh, that comes along with that, and how do people grieve? And the connection with the Iliad there, of course, Achilles, because he's an angry man, grieves with anger, and the gods are displaced with that. David, being a very complicated man, and a man of of great skill and with the ability to express himself. Yeah, heart, heart of a musician. Yes. So, yeah. it expresses his grief in this song, and he writes it out, and he commands that it be given to mm-hmm. the people as a way of remembering and also, quite likely, as a way for them 
to work out their own grief. Right, uh, like a channel mm-hmm. to, for that positive energy because it reminds me of a podcast we did in the past. And I don't have to look back which one it is, but we talked about Carrie Fisher. Right. And when she said, uh, when there's heartbreak, turn it into art. Right. Take your broken heart. Take your broken turn heart. It into art. Yeah, and that's what resonated with me mm-hmm. was the idea of a broken heart. There are two things you can do. You can sit in a dark room and not do anything, or you can finally kind of muster up some energy and kind of channel that. And that kind of, the song of the bow, or mm-hmm. the song of the right, song of the bow, or the uh-huh. bow. It's the bow. That's kind of remind me of. That's a very positive way to deal with something that we all go through. I mean, there's different ways of grief, but mm-hmm. I mean, of course, the death of a loved one is one thing. But there's also you know changes in life and things like that. But uh, there's there's a rich tradition of history, like you said in your meditation, where all of these artists you know took that and channeled it through something to to vent it, to mm-hmm. almost let it go, I guess, or give it to the world. Right. Uh, Ben Johnson, when I mentioned the lines written at the death of his son, Wordsworth also uh, doing the same thing with his Mm. death of his young daughter, Catherine, Uh, out of that profound grief of a parent trying to make sense of why Mm -hmm. a life so new and so full of promise would be cut short, find the only avenue for that really in their own creative endeavors. And so they leave that as a marker. And Johnson's lines to me are so suggestive when he says, here lies Ben Johnson, his greatest poem. Right. And what does it say about our own lives, our own creative endeavors? That's the huge question that obviously Tennyson wrote on and on and on Mm -hmm. about. Yeah, for years, right? So what does this mean about what we all try to do? One of the great poems in the English tradition also uh, prior to Tennyson, but then following uh, Johnson and Dunn, was Milton's poem, Lycidas. I don't know how often that's read now. It's a it's a very classically oriented type of poem, but that was written, too, about the death of a friend of his at 27, I believe, in a shipwreck. And although they'd not been especially close, Milton supposedly, found the death of someone who was like him in that preparatory and energetic stage of life to be a jolting question about what all of this might mean. Right? Why, why have I prepared for all of this? Why do I have all of this ambition if beyond all means of control, I find my life is cut short? Right. And that's one of the things I was reading about was mm-hmm. – this complexity of grief, especially at death. One of them, is it a mirror? Meaning, are you seeing yourself in this death? You know, mm-hmm. understand a father. When a father dies, you kind of, the son looks and goes, wait a minute, I'm next, because right. that's the last bit of lineage. Right. Especially if someone in your own age that you that you see yourself as. You're, when you're sad, they're gone. That's, that's one side of it. The other side is, that's, whoa, that's me. You know, mm-hmm. that, that could be the same thing. But that grief is also that understanding of the lack of control we had. Death is the ultimate lack of control. And in religious belief, there are different ways of trying to come to grips with that. Obviously, Don alludes to Paul and mm-hmm. Christ's victory over death. Death is itself defeated, and death will die. Right. Interesting thing about uh, that particular poem of And that's uh, Death Be Not Proud, right? It's Death Be Not Proud. It's part of a series of poems, Divine Meditations, they're called, published actually after Dunn's death. He became uh, a priest in the Anglican Church. He and his wife, Anne, had lost several children prior to that, and then lost another child, and then, and this is shortly after he became a priest, both his wife and the child she was attempting to deliver died. And so you, you have this person who is the representative of faith. Right. I mean, he's the guy, I mean, I can identify with this, who stands in the pulpit and is supposed to convey to the people the word of hope and faith. He was living, obviously, also in a time of the plague in yeah. London, so death surrounded him. Yeah, some uh, on dark all sides. So, how do you present that? And I think the depth of this particular poem pulls up all of those questions, and yet affirms something at the end about death itself being susceptible to death. I like that it makes it into a hum- like another being. Like death is a person that right. can be conquered, which 
quite an interesting way of looking at that. Right. And a part of the ancient tradition, medieval tradition, we see that in many cultures, right, with death being represented, and the Greeks did it too, mm-hmm. uh, as a personification, as a person. And so you can treat it uh, as a living thing that must then also Which is funny. Death be is capable a, of dying. That's a juxtaposition. Right. Death is a living thing. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it is, you know what they say, mm-hmm. the two certain things. Right. right. And everything with the yin and the yang, right? It, mm-hmm. all, it all rolls together. Mm-hmm. The... Other thing that you and I had talked about a little bit before we began, we here are people writing about the deaths of mm-hmm. others uh, dear to them, the one left behind. There's another tradition that lives on of what's called the valediction, um, which is a goodbye, right? Like say a, it sounds a, like a graduation right, speech. Like a valedictory speech mm-hmm. is to say, so long, you know, been good to know you. But it also can mean, I know I'm about to die, and in the last year or so, there have been two uh, much-read and discussed books, uh, one, Paul Kalanithi's When Breath Becomes Air, and another one written by Nina Riggs uh, called The Bright Hour. Both of them relatively young people in their 30s, uh, married, family, facing a terminal cancer diagnosis, and so they took that as an opportunity to say something about their own lives and to leave behind some part of them. A record, yeah. In in art, in language, for their children and for their spouses and for uh, the life that was left behind. And that's that small glimmer of light at the end of all that, you know, tragedy and grief, you know, that grief, uh, you know, the stages of grief and all that stuff. I guess at some point there's acceptance. And then you add that sixth level in there, which might be, Immortality, like the like, or or putting your stamp on something, meaning like I'm going to create something that will last longer than this coil did, possibly. Right, and that's yeah. that's part of the urge to leave something behind, uh, to leave one's mark. But at the same time, most of these poets raise questions even about the validity of that and the longevity of that. So, what is the larger purpose here, uh, and what is the appropriate response to death and what is the stance that we have in relationship to death? I don't think we've gotten worse at that, but I don't think we've gotten any better. Well, that's the biggest fear, though. That's the one thing that lays out there that we even – that's the, it's one combination we all have of all mm-hmm. diversity we have. Guess what? At one point, there's, an end, there's a finish line, and right. we all are – you know, the Stoics will say, right. uh, do what you made today because you, there may not be a tomorrow. Right. That's one to, way of looking right, at it. Right. You have to begin every day with the yeah. idea that this might be your last opportunity to do. Make it count. Those things that you feel called to do. And that kind of goes back to the idea of when there is that time of mourning, and mm-hmm. a lot of cultures have this, this time of mourning when you're kind of given a pass, mm-hmm. you know, you can't do this because they're in a time of mourning or to give them a, give them a break. But at some point they all say, it's over, it's time for you to move forward. And again, the idea of like, your time's coming too, you can't spin it in a shell. You, you've got to move above this and move forward or you're not doing – the person that left doesn't want that, and you don't, you're don't. you not going to want that either. You're going to really regret that. Right. You know, in, in the book of Ezekiel, there's a passage that is read at the Easter vigil about the Valley of Dry Bones. <laughs> right. And God takes – I mean, we may have talked about that yeah, in a yeah. previous podcast where God takes the prophet out and to, mm-hmm. sees this Valley of Dry Bones, and he's – says, can these bones live? And he said, prophesy to the bones. And then there's this wonderful scene of the bones coming back together and coming back to, to life and sinew and skin and a, a profound picture of the resurrection, of, of mm-hmm. what happens. Things are dead, and yet things will live. And one of the things I think that art does is to work with that. If, right. if Arthur Henry Hallam dies and the world never gets to see his promise, then one of the things that Arthur Tennyson can do is to create the shape of that life in another form. Right. And talk about the power of that life even by talking about its absence. Is it putting meaning to that? Life being taken away? More meaning? Well, it's putting meaning with it. I think it's also attempting to say it's not over. As long as I remember, which is the message we get with the right. Christ mm-hmm. on the cross, it's it's not. This is just a passage. 
Right. And there's a, a bit of it, too, if you remember Shakespeare and his sonnets, who, where he says, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay. Right. Uh, all the gilded monuments of time well, stand. Ozymandias, right? Right, right, That's right, right. the thing. Mm-hmm. That's more decay, but there was this great man, where where is it gone? And Right, but the, well, the monument broken, but, right. it, but it lies there. So there's the sense that art itself can endure and give life. Then, of course, the question is raised, uh, if you think back even to, to what I said about the Song of the Bow, he commanded that it be written in this book, That's which gone. is now lost. <laughs> how do we ha- I wonder how we have it, have, have it now. I guess because well, oral tradition, maybe? Well, it, it ended up, that song ended up in that text. Okay. But what were the other songs? We right. don't know. Right. Remember the name of the rose? Remember that? The uh, James Bond. My yeah, goodness. Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, a young, very young other actor that looks like Jack Nicholson. But uh, and I but can't even. A fantastic movie, though. A great movie. P- period and, piece. Yeah, and a wonderful book if you've got the time and energy yeah. to put in with that. But there was the burning of a whole library. That's and right. Text that no one would ever see. Like I, I was thinking Constantinople. If there was it was in, if that book was in there, it was in there. But it's gone now. Alexandria, yeah, Alexandria, the, the great yeah, library right, at yeah. Alexandria, uh, and there have been books written about the loss of the, all the great books. I mean, right. here are all the things that we heard once existed, but the text is lost to us. There's a great show on Netflix called Detectorist about metal detector uh-huh. uh, people, and, and of course in Britain, where there's you know thousands right. of years of history, and they're unearthing all these things that were lost forever, you know, and it's bringing new a new chapter to this. Thing that went the you know in the earth nine hundred years ago. Wow. Well, when they find King Arthur, what's going to happen then? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it will Excalibur will be in, will be in a stone, and no one will be able to take it out. <laughs> right. Then, then, just, then all of us will freak out. Right back. Um, there's a rich tradition of that music too. Of mm-hmm. you know the, one of my favorite records by Sting from the Police. Mm-hmm. His father passed away, and he was actually went to writer's block. Uh, yeah. Again, in, in those stages of grief, right? He couldn't write anything. Mm-hmm. He starts writing this piece about his father, and then a whole album comes out called Soul Cages. And it's a mm-hmm. very dark, beautiful record. But again, something that came out of that was very important to him to probably help him with that process of moving forward. Right. And uh, you mentioned also Eric Clapton. Oh, Tears in Heaven. Yeah, yeah. that was his son mm-hmm. Connor fell fell out of wow. a window on a right. high rise. That is, But it took him forever to get that one out, too. That was uh, not even... There was something he had written that he too painful to write. Mm-hmm. Time went long enough, and he was commissioned to write a song for a movie soundtrack, a movie called Rush, mm-hmm. and it came out of that. But and it helped. But he did. He said it really helped me get through this awful, awful time right. in his life. You know the poem that I mentioned by Wordsworth, uh, "Surprised by Joy." The the poem is a, is about him having the experience of being surprised by joy. I mean, and other people have used that title, but right. surprised by joy, uh, impatient as the wind. To, he has this this bright, joyful thought, and he's impatient then to share it. And then in that moment, he realizes that the one he would want to share it with is gone. Isn't it? Then he's he's stricken by a new grief, which is, how could I have forgotten? Right? So you're almost guilty by, that one. by feeling good, and then you realize... Oh, that's, right. yeah, that's tough. But then you you write this poem about that. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of like a deciphering that feeling, you know? Like, what am I actually feeling? Because that is so confusing. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's like a move again, the, the infinity uh, symbol of like, mm-hmm. hey, happy, happy but sad, sad. And then now I'm even sadder and then Which back and forth. says, I mean, I think that that poem is a beautiful inaction of the process of grief. And, and that's, and a lot of people will now say this. The Elizabeth Kubler-Ross stages of grief, and we've all read that, Mm -hmm. and we all know that it's kind of been enshrined as a process. But it does imply that it's a process which has a beginning and an end. And many people would beg to differ on that Right, one. because it, it's it, a, just, it lingers. It, it, well, yeah. it doesn't necessarily go away. Right. And it can come back. And it, it is, though, like Wordsworth said, a way of kind of measuring where you are. Because what he does at the end of that poem is he says, the grief that I felt in realizing that I had forgotten you was not as great as the grief that I felt when I stood and realized that I would never see you again oh, so for the first time. It's gotten better. It's, so um, I, can, I can measure it. The right? Jordan Peterson rule of don't compare yourself to somebody else, compare yourself to yesterday. It's right. am I getting to a point where I'm okay, not good with things, but you're, mm-hmm. you're getting better. Right. How yeah. does this grief compare to the grief that I have felt before? Yeah. And 
it's just a beautiful measure of that, I think, without trying for any kind of resolution. That is good, yeah. Without trying to answer something finally. And that's a question that perhaps I shouldn't, of all people, ask about Dunn's poem. I mean, he gives that assertion at the end in Paul's voice. Right, and Paul was quoting someone else too. Right. Well, when the, he said again, that, the, again, so, the evolution of something from people who have been there in, mm-hmm. in their past. That have but it, on. it's almost as though I don't have anything within me that can affirm any certainty about the nature of death. But I can pull back on something mm-hmm. and and use it as an assertion. I can well, use it as a way to work through where I am right well, now. Especially something that's time-honored, meaning that's a thousand years. I mean, how can a thousand people be wrong if they keep saying that's kind of how it works? Well, there that's a point. If it is that enduring. Well, and at least you don't feel alone. Th- it's you know, nice. It's, it's nice. not just me. Well, right? it's nice to read mm-hmm. something and say, wow, holy moly, I couldn't put that into words, and someone else put that into words 300 years ago. That makes me feel connected, right. and not that I feel so isolated. I can remember reading once about actually Mary Shelley since we're talking about literature today. Her book uh, Frankenstein has been much uh, in the press lately cuz I believe it's at the 100th yeah, anniversary. That, yeah, it just came out. I just heard a thing mm-hmm. on the radio yesterday about that. And a powerful story, right? That is told and retold in lots of different ways and lots of different media mm-hmm. all the time. But I remember reading once long ago someone trying to explicate Mary as a young woman and her own grief at the death of her own baby, and how was that related to this story and the creation of this story? And the point was was made that I thought somewhat callously that well, people in that age were more accustomed to the death of oh, children than geez. we are, as though that somehow or other means that their pain was less than ours. Right. Which I think it could not possibly be. So back to your point, people have always felt this kind of intense pain. And no matter how common it may have been, I mean, death has always been common. Death continues to be common. It is (laughs) the end of every life. But to say that it at some point in time was not painful for people or that it's less painful for some people than others, how can you say that? All I keep thinking is valedictorian. That's not what, it's, what no, it is, but yeah. it's valet what? Oh, valediction. Valediction. Uh, David Bowie dying uh-huh, right. on his, and he knew, kept it a secret, made the record Black Star mm-hmm. when you listen to it. Actually, I Am Lazarus is actually the right. first na- first uh, uh, song on the record. It is literally him, I think, coming to grips with this ending of his life on Earth. And then you have uh, Warren Zevon has a record mm-hmm. called The Wind. Same thing, cancer, knew he was dying, used every energy that he could to work through it. I love the song, uh, Keep Me in Your Heart, which is Mm -hmm. a wonderful song, the last song he ever recorded, which is a plea to his family and his friends to remember him, which is a makes me cry every time I hear him about to cry right now. Talk about some courage and not ignoring that stuff and to feel that pain, but to move it in a different direction and, and change it into a different format and to bring something, to bring life out of something that is bringing so much decay. Right. Well, let me throw this into that. The gospel lesson for last Sunday was the story of Jairus' daughter. And in the middle of that, it's another one of those sandwich stories where it, uh, because Jairus, who is a, a, a well-connected and prominent man, he and his friends come to Jesus because his little daughter is at home and she's dying and wants Jesus to come. Well, in the middle of that story, right as he's kind of making his way through the big crowd, he feels someone touch the hem of his garment, and there you have the story of the woman with the hemorrhage that's been going on for years and years. So she reaches out and she touches Jesus' garment, and she's immediately healed. He feels the power go out of him and says, who touched me? And she then tells him that it was her, and he says, you are healed. Your faith has made you well. And then he picks up with the story, and he heads on toward Jairus' house, and the news comes out that the child is already dead. And he says then, it's very much like the Lazarus story, right? Uh, He goes in, he strokes her head, he takes her hand, and he says, little girl, get up. Mm -hmm. And she does. Well, is it meant to be some kind of exceptional story to make other people who've lost their children feel bad? Or is there something else going on with that story? Does it say something about 
the resurrection that is hard for us to deal with? Is it an emblem of of Christ's power? What what exactly is that story doing? And I'm not. I didn't have to preach this Sunday, and so I'm, <laughs> I'm not uh, ready to formulate whatever I would try to do with that story. But it does fit into the other things that we're talking about, about healing, uh, about the nature of death and resurrection, and whatever that might be. Mm-hmm. And is this a sign of how things will be? There's a small mm-hmm. part of that story that I think kind of relates to this. It's when someone mentions to to Jesus, she's already dead. He looks at her, looks at the person and says, she's not dead. She's just sleeping, sleeping yeah. which I kind of take it back as this is me looking at it, is that one little comment kind of says, death is not what you think it is. You know, Jesus is telling that person, you think she's dead. I'm telling you she's asleep. It's something different than what you think it is. Right. Well, our friend John Donne, right, Uh in the poem that we've been talking about, talks about sleep when he says, From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and soul's delivery. So sleep is a pleasure and a rest. Mm -hmm. Death also may be a pleasure and a rest. Different way of looking at it. Right. And that is captured actually in the Burial of the Dead liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer when in the opening anthems we say, or the priest says, blessed are they who die in the Lord for they do rest from their labors. Wow. So there is a sense that death is, uh, and and we find that often in the case of someone who suffered long, right. or in the case of the very elderly who are ready, uh, that it is a release, uh, a rest, and so the sense that that it is not a permanent state, but a, a kind of respite state, and that takes us into the whole idea of. The, well, the resurrection itself, but also off into apocalyptic literature and all that, where we don't <laughs> want to go. But there's a beauty in that, isn't there? Yeah, Dunn, it really is. Dunn treats it very gently there. Yeah, and it uh, softens the blow of, mm-hmm. of death for some people. It's a good way also to explain it to children, too. It's a resting time between the, someone's work and then their next thing they have to do the next day. But we're not quite sure what happens, but it's like a dream. Well, But there's a reality to it, too. Yeah. Well, when Jesus talks, as we have, have mentioned um, several times lately, about the seed, unless a seed falls into the earth oh, and right. dies. Oh, right. Correct. Right? Nothing comes up. Nothing it. is born. And it's very much built into the whole cycle of, of being mm-hmm. that it falls into the ground and it dies. It rests and in that darkness, in that unseen, and Jesus talks about the that unseen, a lot, right. then the, that birth of the new takes place. Hmm. Well, that's a really good place for us to mm-hmm. end today. Thank you so much for having this discussion on on grief and dying. Well, thank you, Johnny. Uh, so Death Be Not Proud, which I'm sure I probably got in some literature class in college and probably just forgot, but uh, I was exposed to that poem by the Grateful Dead. Oh, really? Yeah, they do a, a, a version of, uh, it, I think it was a, a old spiritual based on that song, but it's Death hmm. Be Not Proud. They played that for decades. Yeah, there are versions of that that turn up um, <laughs> in movies and some places. So Jerry Garcia, you know, exposing mm-hmm. things to me again. So <laughs> another one who's passed on. From, and, from and, beyond. Yeah. And resting. Uh-huh. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, this has been Pulpit the Pew, and I am Johnny Gwynn. And I'm Beverly Gibson. And Beverly Whitman on your final word. Amen. If you'd like to know more about Beverly Gibson and Christ Church Cathedral, please visit ChristChurchCathedralMobile.org. There you'll find information on the church, Reverend Beverly Gibson's recorded sermons, and sermon notes. If you want to know more about Johnny and his sabadoodles, visit PulpitToPew.com. I would also like to thank Deep Fried Studios and producer Stacey Wellborn. Without her, this show would not get made. If you have any comments, likes, dislikes, please send information to Stacy at deepfriedstudios.com. Everyone have a great day and thanks for listening.